This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the 15-inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar, the late 2015 model. There's the Touch Bar right at the top of the keyboard, see it? Now this one's a lot thinner and a lot lighter. Apple's is obsessed with that. It's now four pounds, 15.5 meters or so thick. It's so thin, you put it on a table and you almost don't see it. It's like the MacBook Air all over again, isn't it? It's available in this space gray color, or you can get it in the traditional silver as well. As ever, it's a nice enough looking laptop, but is it a pro laptop? We're gonna find out now. So first off, here's the outgoing generation. This one happens to be my personal 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro with the dedicated AMD GPU option, and obviously the new one here. And you can see that indeed it is a little bit thinner, and besides that, the footprint is actually a little, little bit smaller here. It's a little bit less wide as well, so there's that. Uh, I never felt like my 15 inch was all that heavy, but for some people who really wanted more than the 13 inch offered, but the 15 inch was just pushing the weight, at four pounds, the new model is really miraculously portable. I, I, thumbs up for that. Apple is very good at doing that. Now, in terms of the ports, you know the story. The old MacBook Pro had all sorts of nice ports. It had a full-size HDMI port, had SD card slot, USB ports, all that sort of thing. And boy, it feels heavy now compared to the new one. It's kind of funny. So this was your general purpose workhorse. You got two Thunderbolt 2 ports. They can do display port out, all that sort of thing. So yeah, anything you needed to plug in, pretty much it was a go. The new one obviously is the famously port constrained, you get Thunderbolt three ports, four of them total, two on each side. On the 15 inch model, they're all full speed, full bandwidth ports, unlike the 13 inch with touch bar where two are faster than the other two. What's up with that Apple? Hmm. And you have a headphone jack. You don't have an SD card slot. So for pros, that means carrying a lot of dongles. And you could say, okay, get over that. You know, if it's a really great machine, just do it. And I'm down with that, but for pros who travel a lot, just imagine, these dongles are expensive and there's plenty of them, and you're just going to lose them and be suddenly, well, out of luck on the road when you actually need to import some footage or something like that from an SD card slot. That gets to be a pain too, not to mention the expense of losing them. So to import footage into Final Cut Pro or to get stuff off of my SD card from my regular still shot camera, since you folks know by now I'm really into photography, I need this thing right here, which is a USB-C to regular USB adapter. Then I need the card reader. So then I plug these together. Then I plug it into any one of the ports on the Mac. So I got to keep track of this. If I lose one of these pieces on the road, I'm in trouble if I need to get footage out. So got to make sure not to lose them. If I want a full-size display port out, here's another adapter for that. Uh, you can also use, here's Dell's little multi-purpose adapter that actually works. That gives you good old-fashioned VGA for those of you who still have to work with projectors and stuff like that, HDMI, regular USB, and Ethernet. Ooh, Ethernet. There's a single dongle for Ethernet. Apple's selling a whole bunch of single dongles. They've actually dropped the prices significantly for a while because everybody complains so much about all the dongles. But if you need something multifunction, you're going to have to look elsewhere. Here's a Sateki one that works, and this has USB-C pass-through for charging, regular USB-A ports, and HDMI. No SD card slot. Here's a Juice Factory one right here. This has SD card and USBs, but no display outputs. Well, you get the idea. So it's a challenge. It's stuff to keep track of. It's going to cost you extra money. And, um, you know, I'm not going to moan too much about that, but Apple really have sh should have included the regular USB-A adapter in the box for a machine that starts at $2,400, $2,399. To not give you this, which they sell for, you know, $19 normally, is annoying just so you can plug in this, the iPhone. <laughs> All right, now we've gone through the usual complaining about the dongles that are required. What's cool and new? Well, here is the OLED Touch Bar. You get this on the 13-inch Touch Bar Edition model that starts at $1,800, and you get this on all the 15-inch MacBook Pro models. And this is kind of cool here. Sometimes you get little cues about, well, things that you should do. So in this case, it has Touch ID right over here as a fingerprint scanner. Now, fingerprint scanners are not new. We've seen them in the world of Windows for quite some time. In fact, now they're moving on to Windows Hello cameras, IR cameras that do facial or iris scanning for recognition but still it's nice to have here and I really like it a lot better than typing in your password now sometimes you're still going to have to type in your password when you first boot the Mac cold boot it it hasn't just been asleep you'll have to type in your password I imagine for added security also if you're doing something like installing an app like I was installing Unigine Heaven the benchmark and I had to give 
permissions for it to run because it's not a fully sanctioned from the App Store app. And for some reason, I had to use my password then. Maybe Apple thought that was such a serious business that I had to do it. You also have access, say you're just in Finder, to just quick things like your brightness settings, your keyboard brightness settings, your volume control, and all that sort of thing. Now, often, if you're in a program where it has other contexts available, these will condense. And uh, they're a little bit less efficient when they do that. You know, you can control under keyboard settings some of what happens here, but let's log in so you can see what I'm talking about. So now we're in Final Cut Pro, and you can see we have some neat shortcuts here for trimming, for splitting clips, which is fine. And if you want to switch to scrubbing, you've got scrub control right there, which is, again, also nice, and we can switch back. So volume control plus and minus are right here. Now, if I want to control my brightness, I still have up and down. But sometimes, in some contexts, this will be condensed to just one little button symbol for brightness. And then you press and hold a slider, which is a lot less expedient than hitting just your FN key or the virtual FN key over here. Well, there's that. And to give you a little background, I've been using Macs since the mid-80s. I started life as a Mac user interface designer for peripheral companies that made printers, hard drives, and then I worked for Avid also doing that before I moved on to IT and all that sort of thing. So I know something about user interface design, and particularly Apple's design guidelines. This is not the most brilliant thing here because this is the hardest road to see. When you're sitting over here, especially on a larger laptop, you kind of peer over, usually just when you want to do your volume and brightness till you have your muscle memory done. Well, muscle memory is not going to work here because these guys move around. So it's it would be so much better if Apple had just added a touch screen on the laptop. Uh, they really, because touching directly what you're working with is always the best user experience. If you want to scrub, scrub on the screen, for example, that really works pretty well. And when we're just in Finder over here, see here's my single brightness, and I can press and hold, and then I have a slider to adjust it, like so. Yeah, it's less efficient. Okay, fine. And if I tap that, then I can get a full listing of controls right here. Why that's abbreviated to start with, I really can't imagine. It should just be like that. Enough of that. The keyboard, I call it the Clackbook Pro because this is just the loudest keyboard to type on. Let's, and I'm not slamming on it. I'm just, it, it's loud. It's a, a short travel, about a half a millimeter travel keyboard. It's not unlike the 12 inch MacBook keyboard, but they've improved the clickiness, and they really have. It feels better. It, you can feel a distinct click going on here. However, it's very abrupt to travel. The 13-inch one, I really had a pretty high error rate on. I didn't warm up to it. The 15-inch, I find a little bit better. I can type almost as well as I do, say, on the old MacBook Pro keyboard. It just feels very uncomfortable. I wonder, really, about joint wear and tear and RSIs and all that sort of thing, because it's just a very abrupt kind of thing, and maybe one will learn to really have a soft touch, but you have to have a actually a good amount of force to make those keys click. So yes, it's it's a functional keyboard, certainly. And, and again, I'm typing pretty decently on it. I'm just not really enjoying the physical experience of doing it. One thing I do like is the backlighting. In the old one, you had backlighting surrounding each key. And now it's just the masking on the key that lights up. It just looks a lot nicer, and easier on the eyes, a little classier, and less distracting for people who are around you. Then we have the trackpad. The trackpad is so big, it could swallow a squirrel. It could swallow more than just, here's the iPhone 7 Plus in a case. It's bigger than that, isn't it? I, I don't know why Apple decided that we needed a trackpad that big. And it feels a little weird under your hand when you're typing, because your palm rests on it, and you feel it clicking, and you hear it clicking. Uh, the palm rejection is pretty surprisingly really good, given the fact that you're almost always going to be touching this while you're typing. But I did find that it did screw up sometimes, which is not a problem for the old Mac that had a not so insanely large trackpad. For pinching and zooming, that sort of thing, for doing scrubbing on Final Cut timelines, though, it's nice to have a bit more room there, though you might want to use a touch bar if you're scrubbing or a mouse instead, too. I also found clicking and dragging to be a little bit harder. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just such a big trackpad. I wasn't sure if I was using my right or my left, left click when I was doing it, but I often failed the first couple of times I tried to click and drag a file around. The display is the same 15.4 inch size, 16 by 10 aspect ratio, IPS, and same resolution as the outgoing model too, 2880 by 1800. Uh, now for the running best for Retina, this 
display setting, it actually runs a little bit higher. It runs at that uh, 1680 by 1050 resolution, which is what I normally set it for anyway. Apple says that it has supreme brightness and they're not lying and wide color gamut. Indeed, it supports a DCI P3 color gamut and we measured 91% of Adobe RGB. That is nice and it is beautiful. They say 500 nits of brightness. Our colorimeter measured this one at 451 nits. Now our 13 inch one actually measured above 500 nits. So I guess it's just variance in panels. And I can tell you that this is one thing that I really want to have compared to my old Mac. Not that the old Mac was unattractive, but just look at the difference of the two of them. So here are the two of them together and on the right side is the new MacBook Pro. And yeah, it's not just as smaller, slightly smaller bezels because the big, the old one didn't have big bezels and I could care less honestly about that. But look at the difference in brightness and the difference in vividness. While the new one is still actually pretty accurate, it's not oversaturated, which is really fantastic if you're a content creator, if you're editing photos, if you're editing video, that sort of thing. So it's nice, it's noticeably, better. Honestly, you know, the old one doesn't look like junk or anything like that. The new one has that extra pop. Wow. And man, it is bright. Even despite the fact it's a glossy display, you're going to be able to see this in pretty bright lighting. Now the speakers on the new generation MacBook Pro are fantastic. They actually fire from along in here, not the grills on the top, which seem to be ornamental more than anything else. The old one had pretty good speakers. This is really fantastic. The one thing I don't like is when you pick it up and you carry it, this it feels a bit sharp and uncomfortable actually over here, whereas the old one had a little curve and was more nicely finished. So, and also this over here is kind of like a, a little bit of a sharp edge. And that's where your ventilation is over here. You can see the little grill hole, little grill hole. Uh, a fine point there, but every time I pick this up, I'm kind of like, ew, ow, ow. <laughs> Now we can't tear our review unit down as far as iFixit does. So here's their webpage for the 15 inch MacBook Pro. If you want to see everything that's inside in great detail, they're a great resource for that. And, and this, is, this is the motherboard right here. It's pretty impressive. Two fans go in the middle right there and the rest is really taken up by battery. Everything is soldered on board here. Apple kind of heralded in the sealed inside battery with the MacBook Air. That became a thing. Uh, the RAM is soldered on board, which has been the thing for Macs for a while now. It's not unusual on Windows Ultrabooks. So usually the bigger quad core machines still have RAM sockets. And the SSD is now soldered on as well. So you can't upgrade that afterwards. Granted, they always used a proprietary SSD, so there weren't a lot of sources, but you could upgrade it. Not anymore. What you bought is what you bought. It's all soldered on. All right, so what's inside this? Intel Core i7 6700 HQ. That's the same 2.6 gigahertz processor you'll find in the Dell XPS and in many Windows gaming laptops. Intel's sixth generation Skylake, the outgoing model with fourth generation Haswell. So Apple totally just skipped Broadwell and KB Lake, which is seventh generation. It's not available for quad core CPUs yet, so we don't expect to see them in here. As you can see, the base model is $2,400 and that gets you AMD Radeon 450 graphics and 16 gigs of RAM. 16 gigs is max. That's another kind of not pro thing for some people who really want more. If you're running VMs, doing heavy duty 4K video editing, running some certain kinds of simulations, it would be nice to be able to go higher than 16 gigs. You can't. And it's DDR3 RAM. Unlike most Windows laptops with the CPU, they're running DDR4. So it's a little bit slower, but it's also a little bit lower power. If you want to spend more money there, you can see we have the $2,800 model. That gives you a 512 gig SSD instead of the base model's 256 gig, which again, in the spirit of pro, well, probably 256 gigs isn't enough for a lot of people who are actually doing kind of pro use things with it. So that's probably the one you would want. That moves you up a little bit to Radeon Pro 455 graphics. That still has two gigs of VRAM in it, just like the base model. If you build to order on this, you can go up to two terabyte SSD and you can get AMD Radeon 460 graphics with more VRAM. So it gets pretty expensive there. The difference between the, these notches of Radeon processor for graphics isn't super duper high. We'll get into the graphics performance here compared to the old model soon though. Now the SSDs are forever are super fast on the Mac, faster than you're going to see anywhere else. We're not even going to bother showing you it going off the charts for graph, for disk speed reads. This has the fastest SSD period. And Apple is good at that. When it comes to other benchmarks, it scores uh, surprisingly not better than the outgoing model for CPU benchmarks. And given that Skylake should be at five to 8% faster than Haswell, it could be anyway, we're kind of surprised. 
So here we have the Geekbench 4 test run on the new model, and you can see the scores for yourself there. That's a decent score. That's not unexpected for this chip, regardless of platform. But if we take a look over to the left over here, this is the outgoing model, and this is the, what was the $2,500 model with the AMD dedicated graphics, otherwise the, the base model for CPU for that configuration there. And you can see that the single core is ever so slightly lower. That's close enough to not really be meaningful, but actually scores a little higher on the multi-core, more than a little bit higher there. Hmm. Now things look up for graphics, so not as much as we'd like. Again, we have the, the Radeon 450, so if you move up to something as expensive as the 460, you should see hopefully 10 frames per second better than this. But for the Unigine Heaven test, now run on high at native resolution, which in this case is a scaled resolution of 1650, 1680 by 1050 with no tessellation, it scored 23.8 frames per second, which is a score of 600. And the GPU temperature was 76 degrees Celsius, which is, relatively speaking, pretty cold. Now, if you take a look at the screen on my old Mac right here, you can see that it bested it by about 5, 6 frames per second. And the score is 476 versus 600 here. So, yeah, you've got improvement, but that's not a huge improvement. I was really hoping for more. Of course, I was really hoping for NVIDIA GTX 10 series cards in here. We can dream that someday Apple will go back to NVIDIA cards just because Adobe CC apps really support that a lot better for acceleration, for things like Premiere Pro, editing, Photoshop, that sort of thing. And for Cinebench R15 for the OpenGL test, you can see our test result there, 66.8. 83 frames per second, and that is about one frame per second higher than my old Mac got. I expected to see more of a difference there, go figure. But in other tests, running Tomb Raider, for example, I did notice about eight frames per second higher frame rates playing Tomb Raider. So, you know, again, it's a little bit of a change, but is it enough to spend 2,500 bucks for the new model for? Mm, not for that reason, really. So another thing you'll notice, and I mentioned this in the review of the 13-inch, is you get the shiny Apple logo here. It doesn't light up anymore. That doesn't really matter a whole lot to me, practically speaking. So when you open it up now, it automatically boots up. I, I think most people probably find that useful. I mean, only folks like us reviewers actually open and close a laptop a million times to look at it and wish it wasn't booting up. You can use a terminal command if you don't like that, however. Also gone is the startup sound, that traditional Mac startup sound, but you can use a terminal command to bring that one back too. One thing that's more practical, I think, for a lot of folks is the fact that the headphone jack no longer supports optical out. So you music folks, you music creation folks are probably going to, well, if you ever used optical out, you're going to be missing that now. So the latest MacBook Pro 15 inch has a 76 watt hour battery. The old one had a 99.5 watt hour battery. So just like with the 13 inch, they've actually dropped the battery capacity, but Skylake is more efficient in terms of power consumption. That's an 87 watt charger there. Compare that to a comparable Windows laptop with NVIDIA, say GTX 1060 graphics inside, and that would have a 180 watt charger. So that gives you an idea of the graphics horsepower or lack thereof in this compared to some Windows laptops. And also the power efficiency too, that, that, that's actually sufficient. Apple claims 10 hours of use. Now they claimed up nine hours of use for the old DG, GPU model that I had. And I managed about eight hours or so, not being real careful with my power consumption for mixed productivity use. And for this one, I'm doing about the same, about eight hours. Uh, again, with brightness set to about 35 to 40%, it's a pretty bright display. And using Word, editing a few photos, streaming some Netflix, that sort of thing. So poor 15-inch MacBook Pro, I've been pretty tough on it. And that's because I have been a Mac user for so long and have used the 15-inch models, particularly in the last several years. Uh, it's a beautiful product, certainly, but there's a lot of competition, too. I also review and use Windows laptops. And there we have the Surface Book with the new Surface Dial right here and NVIDIA 965M graphics, if you want dual-core CPU, yes. You know, we're going to have a smackdown to talk about the difference between that. But for you graphic artist type, this is the one that comes with the pen. This section detaches. It's a tablet. There's a lot of ooh and ah there for graphics professionals. And Apple should be mindful of that as Microsoft chases after them. And on the power front, we have the 
razor blade, the 14 inch razor blade with quad core, same quad core CPU and much more powerful NVIDIA GTX 1060 graphics. And yes, we'll be having a review of that one soon too. So for those of you who just want a traditional clamshell form factor laptop, but one that looks really cool and chic and is very compact yet incredibly powerful, the razor blade is actually a lot more powerful. So that's the 15 inch MacBook Pro with touch bar, AKA the late 2016 edition, AKA the Skylake edition. The latest version that you can get right now, finally Apple's refreshed it and they've made it the MacBook chic, really. I mean, it's gorgeous to look at. It's very slim, it's very light, but for pros, as you've figured out by now for me and for other reviews too, it's a little bit challenging because of all the dongles that are required. The fact that the, the performance really didn't go up all that much, it's a little... Uh, so I'll be holding on to my last generation one just in case you're wondering. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos. Oh, and hey, if you like this video, share it and give it a thumbs up.